Hello, my name is Patrick Allen, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And the program is administered uh, in this general area down in Cincinnati, Hamilton County Public Library under the direction of Brian Powers, a cameraman today, uh, which is uh, September the 29th, 2022, is Tom Lee, uh, whose uh, re relatives were uh, officers in the Second World War. And he's agreed to be our cameraman today for an interview with uh, John Specht. Uh, John, thank you for doing this interview. Thank you for doing and, it. Uh, is that the name you go by? Yes. All right. Uh, tell us where and when you were born. I was born on August the 7th, 1945. And where? Cincinnati, Ohio. What were the uh, names of your mom and dad? Henry and Dorothy. Dorothy was your mom, and what was her maiden name? Tucker. Where was she from? Maysville, Kentucky. Was your dad from Cincinnati? Yes. Do you know how mom and dad met at all? Not a thing. I don't know a thing about it. Uh, do you have any recollection of when they got married? No. Um, I had a, 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 my oldest sister was 17 years older than I. Oh, really? Yeah, so I mean, my mom and dad were older when I, when I was born. Okay. Um, how long did you uh, stay in Cincinnati after you were born here? Always, every, uh, always, lived, always here? lived here. Good. Uh, and you mentioned a sister, did you have uh, other brothers and sisters? I had three sisters and two brothers. What were your sisters' names? Uh, Norma. And did she Pat. marry? Yes, she was married to Jim Telcher. Kelcher? Tel Telcher with a T. T-E-L-S-C-H-E-R. All right. Um, did Norma have children? Yes. Remember how many? Hmm. Five. I'm going to okay. say five. And uh, according to my notes here, Norma passed away. Yes. And when did she pass away? I, I don't really remember. There's things I don't remember. Okay. And you got another daughter? No, I, I have s sisters. Another, I have another, uh, excuse me. Yeah, Pat, Pat Helmers. Patricia? Pat, yeah, Patricia. And s she married Paul Helmers. All right. And she's still living? Yeah, she passed. All right. You got another sister, Henrietta? Yep. And what was Henrietta's last name? Did she marry? Stanger. S-T-A-N? S-T-E-N. G-E-R. He was a Korean War veteran. And is she still living? No, he's passed. She's passed. And then uh, you're the fourth one in the family. And Sixth did you, one. Did you have a, a son? I had two brothers. Okay, you got two brothers. Uh-huh. And? David. Fred, my oldest brother was Fred, and he married Janice. Is Fred still with us? Nope. Uh, how about David? David's passed also. I'm the last one. So you, you're the youngest of uh, of all six. Yep. Uh, how about your your mom and dad? Do you remember how old your dad was when he passed away? He was around seventy-two. How about mom? And mom was around 78. What, what did your dad do as far as occupation? He was in the banking business and uh, uh, he worked for a company called the Rosebrand Butter and Cheese Company. He was a vice president down there. Was that before or after the banking? That was after the banking. He worked for uh, Provident Bank. Provident Bank uh -huh. in Cincinnati? Yes. And he was a vice president? No, no, no. He was a manager down by Finley Market. Okay, down downtown downtown Cincinnati. Yes. Um, so was he a vice president of Rose Brand Butter? Yeah, yes. Where was that located? I really don't know. It's it's long gone. Was it in Cincinnati? Yes, yes. Is that a place where he retired from? Yeah, yes, he left. He also was... Um, uh, president of the American Dairy Association. Um, he he got into that with with the with the Rose Band Butter and Cheese that that 
uh, he would they he was elected to that position. Okay. And he carried that for about a year, year and a half. Good. Um, was he in the military at all? Never. How far did he go in school? Uh, I think he was eighth or eighth or ninth grade. I bet your mom, her name was Dorothy, and uh, what did she work outside the home? Never. She was always a homemaker taking care of kids. Uh huh. Where did you go to uh, elementary school? St. Martin's in Cheviot, Ohio. How many years did you go there? Eight, eight years. And when did you get out of uh, St. Martin's? Oh, jeez, 58. Uh, did you go to high school? Yes. Where did you go to high school? LaSalle High School. First graduating class out of LaSalle High School. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Uh, and that was in, in, in downtown Dayton? No. I mean, downtown Cincinnati? No, that's right here in, in the western side of Cincinnati, um, 1964. That's become a pretty well-known high school, hasn't it? Yes, it has. All boys. All boys school. Is it still all boys? Oh, yes. How many were in your class? Around 200. And you were the first graduating class with 200? Uh-huh. About how many were in the whole school? 200. At, at, at that time, at that time, we started out as freshmen, and there was nobody above us. So right. we, we were the first freshmen, the first sophomores, the first, first juniors, but first the, seniors. But how many were in your class that graduated? Was it 200? About 200. But how many were in the whole school at that time? I, I really don't know that number. Okay. Um, did you work at all while you were going to high school? Always. What What did you do? Kids Kids jobs. I worked in a pizza parlor and for La Rosa here in Cincinnati. His first His first business over on Boudino, and uh, uh, I worked for a meat cutter. My brother in law was at a, bit of a meat cutting business, and I worked there for a while. And I worked several different old jobs. Uh, did you ever have a newspaper route or anything like that? Well, yeah, but not not for very long. <laughs> that was, yeah, not very long. So, uh, what religion were you brought up in? Catholic. And uh, what what uh, parish were you in? Well, uh, when uh, in the first till I was fourteen, we were at St. Martin's, and then we moved out here to White Oak, and uh, at St. James. And we're doing your interview here at your home uh, at 7769 Demler yes. Lane. Uh, and that's part of White Oak, which is pretty much a subdivision of Cincinnati. Oh, yes. All right. How long have you lived out here in White Oak? Since I was 14. We, we moved out here from Cheviot and um, we've been here ever since. What did you do after you graduated high school? Uh, I worked for a packing company. What was the name of that company? Uh, Coles, Coles Packing. They I, were. How did you spell were, that? K O H L apostrophe S. And they were a. Um, they were made sausage and lunch meat and hot dogs and brats and stuff like that. What did you do for the company? I drove a truck. I drove, I drove, delivered for him. And what was your area that you delivered? All over Cincinnati? Uh, all over Cincinnati, yeah. Down into northern Kentucky or no, anything? No, no, they weren't, they were, they weren't federally, federally inspected, so they could only be, you know, in oh. Cincinnati. Okay. How long did you work for Coles? About a year, a year and a half. And then what happened? I went to service. Were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, they were talking about drafting me, but I decided to enlist. And what service did you enlist in? In the United States Air Force. Where did you go to enlist? Down at the uh, Federal Building. Downtown Cincinnati? Yes. Why did you pick the Air Force? I didn't have much education, uh, only, only high school, and I wanted to pick up some more education. And I figured that was my best way of doing it. 
Where did you think they were going to educate you? Uh, well, uh, we took tests to get in. Okay. And I did well in electronics, and actually I did pretty well in all the tests. So they told me I could pretty well pick what I wanted, so I picked electronics. And the training that I got there, I used the rest of my life. So you, you signed up in Cincinnati down at the Federal Building. Yes. And then where did you go? Well, then we, when we finally left, I, I, I signed up with a, a friend of mine uh, who were, were still keeping contact. His name was Dave Hooper. We joined on the buddy system, thinking that we were actually going to be together the whole, the whole time, but uh, it didn't quite work out. But we went to basic training together at Lackland Air Force Base down in Texas. And what did you do down at Lackland, and how long were you there? I was there about six months. We did the, uh, the basic training, and then they had a second phase. And then we were waiting to go to, um, they had selected Dave and I to uh, go to language school. And they were gonna send us to Notre Dame to learn Chinese, uh, to learn Russian. And that, uh, that kind of fell through because Notre Dame semesters, uh, we were waiting too long to get in. Okay. So they shipped us out in our original career fields, which was electronics for me. And where did you go from Lackland? To Keesler Air Force Base in Bloxy, Mississippi. How were your accommodations at uh, Lackland? Pretty much what you would think of as, as military barracks, you know, bunk beds. Were they wooden structures or? Yes, uh, oh yeah, wooden structures. And it was hot, it was very hot. Even though it was late in the year and it was hot. Did you have bunk beds or did you have yeah. single beds? So oh, no, bunk beds. And where were you, on top or bottom? I was just on the bottom, luckily, yeah. Easier to get in and out of. Uh, yeah, yeah, you didn't fall so far. Well, <laughs> what, what were your, uh, what were your hours of duty down at Lackland? All day long. You were, you were, they'd wake up in the middle of the night to, to inspect, the, you know, it was just a, strictly to, to get you into the military feeling. Just harass you to death, huh? No, <laughs> well, no, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't anything you couldn't take. It was just something different than what you were used to and, and they got you knowing who was boss and, Things like that. It, it was fine. How much of the day did you spend in class down at Lackland? I would say three or four hours in class. And then you did, you know, at calisthenics and, and marching and uh, uh, marksmanship and things like that as, as you went on. It was, it was really, they kept you busy all the time. Did you have any leave between Lackland and uh, Kiesler? No. Did you have a girlfriend at that time? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and when did you first start having a girlfriend? In high school? In high school. What was her name? Gee, uh, you know, that I... Now, Mon is here, so we're not going to get uh, into any no, secrets. No, but you know, uh, <laughs> um, actually, they were most of her friends. <laughs> okay. But uh, there was there was a girl named Janice Neighbor, and. And there was a girl named Kathy Shanling, and they're, they're, we dated. We dated around. It wasn't like we went any, were anybody steady all the time. But did you keep track of the girls while you were at Lackland? Uh, not really. How about Kiesler? Uh, Kiesler, not not really. Uh, I, I dated a girl named Chris Jackson, uh, and uh, she was going to college, and I was at Kiesler, and that kind of fell through, and that was fine. So how long were you at Kiesler? Uh, about a year and a year, and a year, little more than a year. We had, I had, that was in nine months of, of electronic school. Right. It was excellent training. It was just really, hours? very good. How many hours a day were you in electronics training? Six hours a day, six days a week. And when you were in uh, training, what did you do during the day? Study. Okay. But it, it was, it was really kind of a normal life. Um, you studied and you, you know, 
you, you kept your area clean and things like that, but there was really nothing, nothing extraordinary. Were your accommodations any different than they had been at Lackland? Four man room, uh, two double, two bunk beds in there. And Did the, you get the bottom one again? Uh huh. How was the food there at uh, Lackland and Kiesler? Absolutely excellent, always. We always had good food. I don't care where we were, we had good food. So uh, where, where'd you go from Kiesler? From Kiesler, I got, I got sent to uh, uh, Gentilly Air Force Station, which is in Dayton, Ohio. But that is really the Defense Electronic Supply Center. I was there for about a year, I think, about what, that. What was your rank when you got to Gentilly? I was say, uh, um, airman for, uh, I was a two-striper, airman second class. How about when you left Gentilly? Did you have any promotions? No. What did you do at Gentilly? I was, uh, I did my, uh, I was a te telecommunication, telecommunications systems control specialist. That's what I was trained for, and that's what we did. We, we actually, it was a message center for pretty much all the, all the military. It was an amazing place. So it was actually the communication hub? Mm-hmm, yes. So what were your accommodations at Gentilly? Uh, we, we, there were none. We had to rent apartments and we, we lived together, we lived in apartments. We picked guy, we got together with other guys and lived in apartments. I actually lived down in the University of Dayton housing with, with four other, three other guys. Well, back in those days, that was called the ghetto, wasn't it? It was the ghetto. It absolutely was the ghetto, yeah. Um, what, what happened to your buddy that went in with you on the buddy system? Was he with you at any of these times? He went to, uh, he wound up going to California to take Chinese. He, I didn't, they, they gave you a test, and I didn't have the uh, ability to get the tones for their language. There's a lot of yin and yang with, the, with their language. Okay. And I didn't have that, and he did. So they sent him to California to learn that. And uh, he got out there. And then when he found out what they were gonna do with him when he was there, then he really kind of just let that go. Uh, they were gonna send him on an island up off of Alaska to listen to Russian broadcast uh, a month at a time. Okay. And then he would get to come back to the States for a week and then he'd have to go back up there to listen. And he wasn't, that wasn't what he wanted to do. So did he have a choice on something else? Uh, he became, uh, uh, he, he was in, he wound up becoming in graphics, uh, in, in, the, in the graphics for, for charts. They made charts and things for you. A funny story that goes with that was when I was in Korea, this, this man, this Dave Hooper, had a real deep voice, very, very deep voice. And, and uh, when he would call my house when I was in high school, my mom would say, Hooper called, because he had such a deep voice. Uh -huh. Well, when I was in Korea, I was a shift chief. And uh, they, I called, I needed something in graphics. And I, and I, a guy answered, Sergeant Hooper. So the same guy? I said, are you a big, ugly man? <laughs> he says, who the hell is this? And I said, I'll tell you. I said, we'll meet at the library after work. We'll meet. <laughs> and went over there, and there he was, bigger than stuff. So, Good. Then, so we got to spend time in Korea together. We didn't spend our, all our time together, but we did get to spend time together, which was really neat. And you knew him since childhood? No, well, high school. Went to high school together. Uh -huh. in, in fact, uh, I, would, I dated a girl, and then I didn't date a girl, and then some guy moved in on her, and I was going to knock the hell out of him. And then I went and visited him, and, and he was about six foot four, and 
250 pounds in high school. And I thought, I think I'll make you my friend. <laughs> Discretion was a better part of valor. Yeah, it was. It was nice. Yeah, she was a nice girl, but I wasn't going to take a whipping over it. <laughs> okay, so we've got you at Desi, and where, where'd you go from Desi? Went from Desi to the Philippine Islands, to the first mobile communications group. How did you get to the Philippines? We flew. From where? From uh, I flew out of uh, I flew out of Cincinnati to uh, San Francisco. I spent a little time in San Francisco, San Francisco to Hawaii, and then to Guam, and what? then into the Philippines. How long did you spend in Frisco before you went on? A couple of days. Okay. Uh, uh, they. The, you know, you had to get your flight scheduled and get in that, and it was kind of a, a commercial flight that you actually flew. All right. And and to, to Hawaii, and then I think Hawaii, it was a commercial flight, but it was rented by the military. What um, what about your time at Desi? Did you have opportunities to come uh, down to Cincinnati to visit? Always, always. I had great great schedule. And that's when I met my, my wife. Um, she was in college at UC. I'd known her, I'd known her a long, long time. And what's her name? Nina. Nina her name was Nina Rack. Okay. And, and uh, we, we knew each other. We used to go to the, the church teen meetings and stuff. And I knew her from there, but I never dated her. And I was home on leave, and we ran into her up up around UC. Mm -hmm. We were in a I was in a in a bar with a friend, and she was there, and I wound up asking her out. We've been together ever since. Great, great. We married 53 years. And uh, so you got married when? Oh okay. yeah. I got married June the 21st, 1969. Uh, that's, a, that's a test that some guys flunk, but you, yeah. did, you did great. No, I mean, <laughs> I, um, we had planned this whole wedding through the mail. I was writing, we wrote every day to each other while I was in the Philippines and overseas. And she would, she, we decided to get married. And uh, I, went to, I went to Vietnam to get to get hazardous duty pay so I could get enough money to buy her a ring. I, so you know, volunteered to go to Vietnam so you could get married? <laughs> so we get married. Oh, so. Well, what, what, did, uh, what did Nina do? Uh, is she a high school graduate? Oh, no, college graduate. Where did she go to school? UC? University of Cincinnati. What did she take? Uh, 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 education, wasn't it, Nina? Yes. Yeah, education. And did, did she high teach? School, high school education. Did she teach after she graduated yeah. before you got married? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for a little while. Um, she was at Harrison High School down there. And, and, uh, and that was when we, when we got married. And she actually got fired for being pregnant. <laughs> yeah, those were the days. Those were the days. They, they, they allowed that. I, I had an aunt that was a school teacher way back when, and she, she had a hard time getting a job because she was female and not married. Oh, geez. She, she had a heck of a time. Um, I've been to Harrison's new high school. That's quite it's a gorgeous. quite a facility. Yes. Probably wasn't like that when she was teaching. I don't think it, it wasn't. It wasn't near as big, was it, honey? She's she's giving us the eye roll, like I know. I talk, All right. I talk too much. So, what were you doing in the Philippines? Um, I was in a group, uh, a, a communications group. Uh, they call it the First Mobile Communications Group, and uh, we were set up to actually set up any piece of equipment with communications. For any any place anywhere, in the middle of the anywhere, we could go in there with the with vans. We had radio vans and telephone vans, and we could set up a uh, air traffic controller. 
we could set up absolutely anything for a base. So and, where, where were you in the Philippines? Well, I was at uh, Clark Air Base in the Philippines. It's where, a very large, very big air base. Where was that in relation to Manila or any other big city? About 60 miles away from Manila, about the same from Subic Bay. Now, was, was Clark a, uh, a target of the Japanese in the Second World War? Uh, and, yes. In fact, uh, one of the things I remembered by going through these papers, uh, there was a, we, we lived in a barracks over there, and, and uh, there was a hill right behind us called Telegraph Hill, and it was one of the last strongholds for the Japanese uh, during World War II. And we would actually go back there and wander around in there. And there were still caves back in, in that hill that the Japanese had. And they warned us not to go in, not to go in them because they really hadn't gone through them all. So there might be booby traps. There might be booby traps and stuff in there. So we would go in and kind of wander a little bit, but we wouldn't go back very far. If I couldn't see the light of day, I didn't go back too far. Well, I've I've read or heard that uh, you know a long time after the after the Japanese surrender that they still found soldiers that didn't know that the war was over. Did you have any warnings about that? We, well, they talked about it, but we there back in that was 1969 or 60, 68, 67, 68. Um, they they were pretty well. Yeah, they were pretty well clear. Anybody cleared out. We didn't have any anything like that at all. Um, they made us take um, jungle survival school when we were over there okay. because they figured we were going to wind up in Vietnam sometime along the line. And uh, you know, they 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 just taught us some things that we they thought we should know. So. You wanted to go to Vietnam so you could get uh, get more pay, so you and Nina could get married. Yeah, uh, yeah. At what stage? What what year or month uh, did you uh, get transferred over to uh, Vietnam? I'm going to say it was 19. It was December of '67. Okay. So, uh, somewhere around December of '67. Tom, we'll try to use uh, the map here. It, okay, put, it down. put it down a little bit. Right, hang on, let me open up. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Okay, where, where did you where See, did you this, land? This is the, we landed in Tonsonut, which is. Uh, well, we looked for that. We couldn't find it. But was that down? That was in South Vietnam, obviously. That's South Vietnam. Was that anywhere near Saigon? Um, yes. Okay. And then, and then we flew from there to Da Nang, and 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 um, it was it was Christmas and New Year's. It was in that okay. time there. Da Nang is. Da Nang is. Uh, um, right up there. Right there. Okay. So we flew up to there. Did you spend any time in Da Nang? No, about about eight six days, waiting for a flight. Because we were we were carrying uh, equipment and um, sandbags, uh, the, the 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 bags you filled uh, for revetting. Uh, we we were we were when we needed a flight that could get us up there. We needed a C-130 okay. that would fly us up there. And where did you eventually go to? And then we wound up uh, up in Quezon, which is it had to be. It, we were like 12 miles from the border. Uh, and from the uh, DMZ, and I believe this is the DMZ here, okay. right there. And what does DMZ stand for? The militarized zone. That was between North and South in Vietnam. And did you stay there for the, the balance the, the of your time? And the balance of my time, okay. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, John. Sure. So what, what are you doing up there in the <laughs> north part of South Vietnam near the DMZ? We, uh, we were sent over there. There was four of us. Uh, and we went, to, we went there to revet a TACAN. Now what does that mean? A, a TACAN was, a, uh, was a, a piece of equipment that the planes beamed in on 
to land on Quezon. The, the, uh, they sent a beam out so the planes could land okay. and bring them in on top. And uh, it was, it, they needed that thing. And so we were sent over there to protect it. And we, we went over there and actually revetted it with sandbags. I don't know how many thousands and thousands of them. In fact, I, I don't know if there's a picture on there of, uh, you can see, you can see the, the, the uh, that's not it, that's not, that's the van here. This is Vietnam, this is all Vietnam. Okay, this is all my guys. On your knee for stability, park it on your knee, there you go. That was four of us in there. That's a caisson, and from left to right, there's Brandy. Brand Support. And Where's Tom. It? Tom McAleer. M-C-A-L-E-E-R. Yep. You. Uh-huh. And then Jack, Jack Smith. Jack Smith. He's from Dayton. Okay. And where is that in the, the caisson? We were at the tack end before we... Uh, I think that's the reason before we got, we got, we did started it a little bit. We had, we had just, it was hotter than heck up there. And the, the vehicle in there is what? A tack in. It's the vehicle. It's a, one of the vans. It was one of the vans that we set up to uh, support that, that, that airfield up there. Did you have uh, communication equipment in the van? Mm, yes, there was, there was, uh, yes. There's one more picture we'll talk about that, that you that, that was uh, me getting ready to go. They, they had issued us our weapons. And, and what was that weapon? That was an M16. How'd you do in, uh, uh, w w in training with your marksmanship? I was, I was uh, with, the, with the marksman. I was, you know, I, I scored well enough to get the marksmanship medal. Good. But uh, not, 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 it was a... Uh, Fantastic weapon, you know, but it's pretty. Did you ever have to use that when you were in Vietnam? No, thank God. They actually, uh, when when we were attacked, um, uh, it was it was really pretty rough, and all, all of us were all of us were we lived in bunkers. And what? Tell me about the bunker construction. Uh, somebody is looking at this or listening to this 50 years from now, describe what kind of living accommodations you had there. We lived, we had bunk beds. Uh, we were underground, uh, uh, mostly underground, and we, we had we were sandbags all around it to absorb the shock. And uh, it was timbers, made with timbers. Anything above ground was made with big, heavy timbers. And and uh, it was pretty pretty well protected. We were we we were underground. The the we, we were the Air Force guys. There wasn't many Air Force up there. It was mostly Army and Marines, and I think maybe there was only eight or ten Air Force people there. How how big was that base? <laughs> to me, it was very small, but on the Times that I, I've looked it up, uh, I've seen that it was a lot bigger than I experienced. We 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 worked on generators and things like that. There was no power up there, other than what we brought. Now how were the generators powered? They were diesel engines. It's just diesel diesels, things that you would drag behind a jeep. And how, how was the diesel supplied to you? Did they bring it in on yeah, the had fly it crafts in. or they had, trucks? They fly it in. They had to fly it in. Uh, not many trucks got up there. So did you have a, a uh, normal, I'll just call it a normal size landing uh, area? Yes. Yeah, it was all PSP. PSP is a metal, a metal interlocking grid that they lay down on the ground instead of concrete to land on. And the planes that uh, came in and out, were they propeller driven or were they jet planes? No, they were propeller driven. Aircraft, a lot of, a lot of helicopters, lots and lots of helicopters and uh, C-123s, C-130s. Uh, what were the helicopters? 
you know, I, I don't know that very well. Okay. They were marine helicopters. Uh, they they came in with cargo, and they're they're the ones that, that brought us out. They got us out of there and when when they wanted us. When they we we waited days to get out of there. When they told us we had to leave. Well, what was a typical day uh, there at the base? Typical day for for what we were doing was. Um, uh, we would go out and work on that on that sandbag walls uh, till lunch and then eat and then go back out and do it again. We did it all day long until we get dark um, uh, and then it was you know lights out and go to bed and do it again the next day. It wasn't like there was anything really to do. Well did you use your communication skills when you were up there? No. Uh, it, it was mostly just grunt work. Yes, yeah. It was uh, that was what we were sent for, and that's what we had to do. That's what we we knew what it was, and we we had a radio down there to, to down there, but the the guys that were there were there to, they were the mechanics for the tack in that actually maintained the tack in, and uh, we had some we had a a two way radio down to Da Nang just for us to use. Did you have any periods of time when you were able to leave the base and go down to Da Nang or no, anywhere else? Never. So you were up there until you, they got you out? Right, right. Did you have any, uh, before the final assault on your base, did you have any other nighttime or daytime attacks? Yeah, they, they would always try the wire. They would always come. We had the Marines around us. Uh, Fine, fine bunch of guys. Um, uh, we made friends with with I made friends with a bunch of them uh, out there where, where the tack can was right by the wire, and and we would I would go out there with with and yak with them. Um, they were really, but they lived in they lived in crap. You know they didn't they didn't have what we they had. didn't have hooches like you had. No, nothing like that. They well, they, they didn't have in, tents or what? They, yeah, they had, yeah, pretty much so. Yeah. What kind of wire was strung around the base? Concertina wire, and then they had claymore mines around, set up, to, oh, and we we had a, when we went out there to work, we had to be careful that they had taken the claymore mines down. So we didn't uh, accidentally set one off. So describe for us what a claymore mine is. It's a little square box, like 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 that. It's electronically set dynamite. If they face it on the ground like that, and it's it when it bursts, it bursts in particles like that. So anybody attacking can they they would take them out. Did it have a sensor in it, or did they have to actually come no, in they, physical they, they, contact? They have to, no, they'd have to. They'd, they'd set them. They'd, they'd, uh, they had a detonator to set them off. Okay. They had a. They had the Marines had control of that. All right. Um, did you have any experiences where uh, you observed any of those being set off? Yes. Or, and what was the what was the range for the mine? I, I remember it to be about fifty feet. It, uh, about 50 feet wide, you know, and more devastating in the front, or more on the side. Sure. Um, the, and when it, where was nobody attacking, it would just happen to be set off by accident. Oh, okay. That was the idea of of uh, telling us to stay stay away from them until they got them. They would come out. There was a little fuse in the back that they would take out. They'd leave the mine there. But as long as they took that little fuse out, it was safe, it was for, you. safe for us to be around. Okay. Uh, b but your van was up there close to the wire. Yeah, yeah, it was right there. So you're you're working close to the wire when you're doing all this sandbagging. Uh huh. Yeah. And how how heavy were the sandbags? Oh, they had to be sixty, seventy pounds a piece. You had to At do least. that. You had to do that all day. All day, all day. We had to fill the thing with. <laughs> Thing was, you had to fill them. You had to dig it, and fill them, dig it, and fill them. And I, I when 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 I, we were going to when I, we told we were going to Vietnam, they told us we should take stuff to trade, because uh, there's always stuff to trade.
Trade with who? With the Marines, or with the, anybody over there. So, and they told me that hot sauce is a big deal, was a big deal because of their rations. Hot sauce? Yeah, hot sauce, just regular red hot hot sauce. So I went to the BX and I bought a case of red hot, you know, 12 bottles like that. <laughs> Well, I got to like these guys so much I couldn't trade with them. I couldn't, I didn't want to mess with them. You just gave it to them and didn't expect it. So anything. I gave it to them. You know, I, I went out there one night and I took it and I said, here, you know, well, what do you want for it? I said, I don't want anything. It's just, I, I got three bucks involved, you know, give me the, give me my money. <laughs> <laughs> so they were thrilled to death. They thought that was pretty cool. Well, the next day we were digging the sand, filling these sandbags up. The next day, here comes a big ass truck up, a big dump truck full of sand. And we were digging the sand. And the guy, he wound up getting a friend of his for a friend of his for a friend of his. And they brought this sand up and they dumped it for us. And hell, we were in second heaven <laughs> filling those bags. You know, it was faster and easier. And sure. It was really, really pretty good of them. Well, now that you mentioned uh, three, you had three bucks in the uh, hot sauce. Yeah. How had your pay increased from when you were in the Philippines over to the uh, over to Vietnam so you could get married? We got thirty-five dollars hazardous duty pay a month. A month, yeah. I think I think when I went in the military, uh, I got eighty-six dollars a month, and then and then uh, as you were in over a year, you got a little more, and two years a little more. And I made sergeant. I don't remember. I don't even remember. It might have been two hundred bucks a month by then. Well, were you were you sending your extra money home to, I was sending, to Nina or I was your sending parents? Everything home to Nina. I spent everything but twenty five dollars a month home. She would. She would. Uh, I had a couple of bills I needed to be paid, and she paid them, and the rest she kept for furniture. We bought for for our apartment. Well, how, how, you're lifting these 60 pound uh, sandbags. How tall were you and how much did you weigh? I was about, I was about six foot tall and 160 pounds, 170 pounds maybe. That, that Jack Smith, that, that, he was a little guy. I don't know how the hell he did it, but he did it. We all did it. Now here's a temporary duty order. Right. And uh, that, that that pertains to uh, uh, Vietnam, right? And it's got those fellows' name on there. Yep, Glenn Brancifort. Yep, B R A N C I F O R T E. Right. And Jack Smith is easy. John Speck. Now your last name is S P E C H T. Right. And then uh, Thomas McClear. Uh, Mac, what what'd Mac, you call him? Mac, Mac O'Leary. They call him Mac, of course, Mac. you know. What did they call Glenn? Uh, they called him uh, Brandy, because his brands are for it. Mm -hmm. he, he, that was a stem, that was a story and a half. He was getting out of the military, and they sent him over there. He was, he only had a few months left, and, and he, he volunteered to go along, to, to go over there. And he was in the Air Force with you? Yeah. Uh huh yeah, well, he was. All, we were all in the mob. We were all in the first mobile group, crime group. And then, and he went, he volunteered it. And then, the, and then the the uh, the Vietnamese that attacked, and <laughs> he thought he wasn't maybe it wasn't such a good idea that he came. But um, uh, uh, it, it was a nice bunch of guys. And then, and then there was like four or five other people there. In the mob that were there for the for the tack in. How was the? Well, let me let me go back to when you first got to Vietnam. When you got off the airplane, what was what was your first reaction? It was hot. It was scary because we knew it was we were in the war zone. We just wanted to do what we had to do and get the hell out of there. During the time you were over there, were there any unusual odors that you experienced while you were there? Nothing that I can actually remember that, that you didn't. I mean, uh, 
we, there was no toilet facilities there, of course, up, up in Quezon. That's where they, they have this, the burn details you're reading about now. Okay. Um, the, where they would burn the, burn the, burn the, uh, the excrement and stuff. Uh, where those guys would go out and they'd burn the, burn it, and, and they're, they're having troubles with the cancer and think from that. But there was no, just no, they, they had these, they had piss tubes everywhere where they just went into the ground went into the ground and and that was it was ripe all the time how was but the, you look you know yeah you, you just after a while you don't pay attention to it how was the food rations k rations we we ate rations some of some of them we had uh uh were from korea from the war in korea they so. sent us they sent them from what they had in stock and they were from the 50s. Some of the fellows have told me they even had World War II rations. They, they may have. We definitely had them from, from Korea. Uh, and they were fine. I mean, we ate them. <laughs> you yeah. didn't have much choice, did no, you? No, no. Yeah, I mean, everybody knew what a B4 was. And that was cookies. <laughs> everybody knew what the heck that was. And beans and weenies, that was always a good, good thing. Did they have cigarettes in them? No, uh, cigarettes in them. Did yeah. you smoke? Nope. What'd you do with your cigarettes? I gave them away. Just give them away. I had no need for them. Um, we actually, up when we were up, up there, uh, the the men that were stationed up there, that were, well, the other team members that were with the TACAN, they had a, a, a Vietnamese guy his wife came in and would clean the bunker, and then he would come in and he would cook, and we would actually take all our all our rations together, and he would take them and he would make them into a meal for us, and then we then he would you know that was well that sounds good doesn't it doesn't it sound like a nice thing, so then we so we would eat and he, he would doctor them up and it was pretty good. Uh -huh. Well, the day of the attack. They found him standing on top of the officer's bunking with a lantern, waving in the rounds. <laughs> well, I've, I've heard that uh, some of these uh, cooks in the daytime would be trying to kill the soldiers at night. Well, that's, that's about, about what this was. It was him and his son. They would take turns every two weeks coming in and out. And, they, and the last I saw of that guy, uh, the two two blue berets were walking him out, the, walking him down the road. Never saw him again. Uh huh. I imagine they were going to question him or something with him. Mm hmm. But uh, and how about your haircut? Uh, who was cutting your hair? Actually, when uh, Philippine Islands, they they, they had uh, they had barbers, the Filipino barbers. I think the government had a, had an agreement. To hire so many locals, and they gave them every job that they possibly could. Same thing in Vietnam. Yep, same same thing in Vietnam. They, they had they had uh, a lot of locals doing a lot of jobs. Um, have, have any experience where a barber would be cutting your hair in the daytime and trying to kill you at night? I, I have no idea, but I sure hope not. But well, I've had guys tell me that that was the case. It very may or may well have been, but. I most probably wasn't there long enough to worry, worry about my haircut. Uh, uh, we were there for a short time, and the uh, when the Tet Offensive started, um, that was most probably one of the scariest times ever. So, were you you were at that base when the offense started? Yes. Tell me about how it started. Middle of the night. They just started rocking us, rocking and rolling. They were just throwing everything else in there. And the first thing they hit was our ammo dump. And it just kept going off and off and off, if you can imagine how much stuff they had stored over there. And it just kept, it just kept it up, and it kept up for days. Was it pretty obvious where the dump was? Yeah, well, I don't know. See, I never saw what it was by the time I went, when I walked out of the uh, the bunker, you could see it exploding. I mean, it was just 
just rockets and ammunition. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Mortar yeah. shells and everything. See, we had 155 millimeter and 105 millimeter howitzers on the base, and they would shoot off into the hills all the time. Uh, one of the first things I learned when I went there, uh, uh, all of a sudden a round would go off and it scared the hell out of you, and you wanted to grab the dirt. And one of the first the fellas told me, he said, sooner or later, you'll learn the difference between an ingoing and an outgoing. And did you? Oh, yeah, yeah. What was the difference? The difference was when it went boom, <whistles> it was out. <laughs> when it went <whistles> boom, it was in. <laughs> OK. <All right. laughs> so you learn that real fast. So uh, you, you, your, uh, your, your Marines and soldiers would fire the 105s uh, uh, during the day or night? All, all day, all, they did it just, and it wasn't like it was constant, it was just, they called it H&I, it was her, for harassment, and they just fired off into the, into the hills. We, we would set up a night scope on top of the bunker, on the, on the other bunker, and we could actually see movement down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, could, you could see movement down there. Of people walking, uh, people being bi the bicycle, enemy, by being the enemy, bicycles with with rockets on this. They didn't carry them; they had them on their bikes, so they could put wheels on them, so they could go down the trail. And there was there was there was it was pretty well constant constant movement back and forth. Uh, always at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from what we could see, we had the night vision. The uh, we, the army the army guys they, they flew with the, an O2 airplane, which is a spotter a spotter airplane. Fish, uh, fixed wing single legion? It's the, it's double engine rear rear pusher puller <laughs> props, prop in the back prop in the okay. front, um, odd looking thing, and uh, they would they would have uh, rockets. They, they were supposed to be for uh, white phosphorus for marking, and sometimes they put high explosive in them <laughs> and, and, and use them. But uh, they would fly uh, from that base, so those those pilots would come over, and we always had beer, cold. We always had cold beer. What we, brand? Well, it was cheap. Whatever it was, it was not much. Burger? No, no, but no, they didn't have burger over there, but they, it could have been Bush or it could have been Falstaff or something like that. I don't remember. I, I didn't, I drank it, but I don't remember the beer. It wasn't, uh -huh. it was the same everywhere. When I went to, when I went to Korea, it was the same stuff. Philippines, the same stuff? Yeah, well, Philippines was uh, San Miguel beer. That was, they were made, that was made in the Philippines and it, and they, they had they had two types. They had an import, and then they had the local. And you could tell the import from the back of the bottle. It had three lines on it. And then the export was the stuff that was better. It was better to have. They had four lines on it. So if they got the three lines on it, ten, chances are you'd get diarrhea <laughs> if you drank it. So we we you avoided the three we, line. We avoid. You paid a little extra for the four line, mm -hmm. and it wasn't much. Now, where did you get it over in the Philippines? Were you able to go to, to bars or cafes? Yeah, or was they it all had, on base. They, they were, no, they, well, it was on base too, uh, and actually, uh, in this mobile group that I was in, we had our own bar in the barracks. They had a real nice bar. They called it the Mob Bar, but uh, the, we went to. Uh, Angeles City was right outside of our, was that right outside of our base, and uh, uh, all all kinds of bars, uh, but bar girls, um, a lot of music, a lot of really good music. They 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 could mimic like crazy. Uh -huh. They could really we could, and and we would go there and you'd you'd drink the beer and whiskey. Uh, in the in the, in Korea. Though the, they had the same thing, but we were right outside W8. But they had a, you 18, 18 year olds were only allowed so far in the bar, and then 21 year olds could go back where they had the liquor. 
All right. They, they actually segregated it. You couldn't, you weren't allowed to drink. So how old were you when you were over there in Nam? I was just turned 21. And your buddies, the the other three guys that were in your all, group, were all, they all the same, same age? all same b bunch, yeah, yeah. Uh, did did all four of you uh, make it out? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me go back to this Ted offensive, and then uh, you've shown me a, a document, uh, a letter. Uh, that's on, on January 23rd of 68, you and other members of your team were ordered to evacuate Quezon Air Base because of hostile fire. Remember yeah. that? Uh, yeah. Okay. Pretty clearly. What, uh, how, how long were you at the base before they made you evacuate? We were there for days. During the offensive? Yes. Yeah. Um, we saw the, the, we saw the answer to the attack, um, we saw, we, we, we saw our Air Force with the jets and the, they called them, uh, the, they had the airplane with the mini guns on it flying Puff over the Puff the Magic top, Dragon? Puff the Magic Dragon. And they had they had all that flying around. It was amazing. The B-52s were laying it in. I mean, it was just they would they would lay it in, and it would knock me out of bed at night. That's how close they were. Oh. I mean, it was amazing. And 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 uh, as I always told my buddy, where I said, I'm glad they're on our side. Yeah. Because it was absolutely amazing. But we were there, and then and then they, when they had told us we had to leave. Um, we didn't want necessarily want to go because the other guys weren't leaving, uh, and, and they said we had to. The Air Force guys had to leave, but the Marines stayed. No, the, Air, the other Air, Air Force guys with the TACAN had to stay. Okay. And and we, but we were had to get. I had the top secret uh, crypto clearance, and they didn't want us up there, um, just in case. Just in case you got captured. And, yeah, and and so they. They sent in, they, they were trying to get us in, but every time they would send a plane in, they would mortar the, the, the airstrip. And, and so the fixed wing airplane would come in and they couldn't make it and they would go in and out. And you know, we'd be there waiting for days to get the hell out of there. And finally they got a Marine chopper in and uh, we had to unload the ammunition off of it before we could get out of there. Why so, was that? Because they, want, they wanted it off as fast as they could. They wanted to get out of there. But why did you have to take the ammunition off? To, because of weight? They ne No, they needed it on the base. Okay. So uh, So they were bringing ammunition in. They were bringing it in, and when we could catch a flight out. What ammunition had they carried in? Oh, it was all, oh, M16s and 50 caliber and mortars and whatever was in them boxes, you know, we carried it all out. You were helping to move it out? Had to, yeah, or we wouldn't get out of there. And so we unloaded that plane. No sooner that last box was off, we were on and we were off. Was that a, a scheduled trip when that, when that helicopter came no. in? Did you know you were gonna be getting on that helicopter? Well, we knew that we, we knew it was coming in and they said, if you're gonna have a chance to get out of here, that's gonna be your way. So that's, we were there. We would go over to the base to the, to wait for a plane to come in. That's what we were, that's what we would do. And uh, this, the, the letter says that uh, you were forced to abandon your personal belongings and all the government equipment? Everything, absolutely everything. You just left with what you had on? Yeah, I had a piss pot, my M16, and 100 rounds of ammunition. That's that what we it. that was it. That was all that was what we were allowed to carry. I had pictures of my wife. It was a separator in the thing on my wall. I had to leave all that. I had to leave all my uniforms, all the stuff I had. Um, everything. And we you know, that's all that red clay up there. We were all kind of dirty and messy. 
we got back to the Philippine Islands, we could get a shower, but we couldn't. And we were ordered to the colonel's office the next day. And we were walking to the, we were walking to his office. And a captain got us and chewed our ass out for being so crummy. Cause we, you know, boots weren't shining. The so, uniforms were a little baggy. And what'd you tell the captain? Well, we, we just said, yes, sir. And that was it. And then we got into the colonel's office and How's it going? And he was really a good guy. I liked him. He was a, he was a great leader. Um, and uh, he said, "What? What? How's it going?" I said, "Well, I said we just got our ass chewed out by the captain out there." And he goes, "Really? Come on in here." And he he eat, brought the captain in. He eat him up. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "You know where these boys have been?" No. God damn, you better ask first. <laughs> and so, and uh, he asked, "What, what, what could, do, could, what, what, what should we do? We've never had this before." And all the, and all the teams they ever sent out, they never had anybody evacuated like that. And we said, "Well, we're, you know, it would really be nice if we'd had flak jackets. We didn't have any flak jackets. We didn't have gas masks. We didn't have any of that stuff." And and. Uh, He's, he took care of that. He, well, how about the how about the base? Was the base overrun in the uh, in the Tet Offensive? Nope, nope. They were able to hold out. They held out. Yeah, they held out. And they were a lot of the guys that I, uh, a lot of the guys at the Marines, they got killed. They were really nice guys. Yeah, yeah. How about the rest of your uh, your Air Force buddies? Did they survive? They got medals. They got silver stars and bronze stars. And yeah, they did great. Did they have to take part in the actual fighting? I don't think so. I think they, but they kept the, <clears throat> two of the guys were, uh, two of the guys were uh, generator specialists. Okay. Okay, and so they kept the generators going and the uh, other guys were the tachyon guys, and they kept the tachyons going so that they could, could uh, they had to bring another one in because they blew the first one up. And, uh, um, but they were still able to bring the planes in and out. Yeah, yeah, they had, that's what they had, they had to be able to do Is that. Is that what the B-29s relied on? I, I, I no, the, the, yeah, the, but, but, the, the C-130s and C-123s are what landed at Quezon and the helicopters. Nothing big, nothing like a okay. B-29, nothing like that. Um, it was strictly a, uh, strictly a... Um, Supply. Supplies, yeah. and, and and it wasn't, the, the runway wouldn't have handled them. The big planes. The, plane, the big planes like that. Uh, it was, it was an, it, the, the brave guys, uh, tough, guys um, all around uh, and like I said when you ask if it was a big base or a small it was a small base and it was even smaller for me because it was I was only in between the bunkers and the tack in every day that's what uh -huh. we did we never wandered anywhere uh -huh. um, <clears throat> one, one of the things we did <clears throat> we had the radio down to Tanang uh, that it was our our personal first mob thing, and we called up down there and told them we were out. We were, we were running out of our very first immediate supply, and that was beer. <laughs> so they um, they said, "Okay, we'll take care of it." <laughs> and this is before the offensive. Uh -huh. And they sent a whole airplane pallet full of beer with a cover on it marked top secret. <laughs> <laughs> and they, when it landed, they, they called and they told us it was over there. It's marked side. You got to put a guard on it. So Jack, Mac, Jack Smith went over there and walked guard on the damn case on the beer <laughs> because we couldn't unfold it. We couldn't undo it there because of the Marines. The, you know, they, they didn't necessarily get all that. So we stole Two, they called them mules. It was like a jeep, a, 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 
it was a no, no a little it was like four wheeler four wheeler uh, and w and we would and all my hauled beer beer back and put it in our bunkers. We had it under the bed in the foot lockers. We had it all over the place. <laughs> Did you leave any for the Marines? Hell no. Well, actually, the, the actually the truth of the matter is, the Marines weren't allowed to have so much. They didn't put anything on us. Uh, but we we uh, they would come over and visit, and, and we had a shower. We had a fifty-five gallon barrel. With an electric heater on it, because we had the compressor, the we had the electric. We had a little electric heater in it, and we'd heat that water up when we could take a shower. Uh huh. So the Marines would come over and you know, can we take a shower? Yeah, you gotta fill the tank. So they would take a shower and then fill the tank. Well, by the time you took the shower and then carried the water to fill the tank, you were sweating again. <laughs> you might as well take the bath. Yeah. But uh, it felt good when you did it. Sure. Yeah. And then, you know, you want a beer? Oh, hell yeah. So they would sit and have a drink or two or three uh -huh. or nine. And then, you know, but we were always, well, we, we didn't turn anybody away. And that's why we got along with those guys. They were good guys. They huh? were all good guys. Yeah. They were all good guys. And the, the other guys from your mob were good guys? Oh, they were excellent, excellent. And you've kept in touch with, uh, with who since you got back? Um, None of the guys that I was over there with. Uh, there was a guy named Tom Farina that I was in Korea with. He was a telephone guy. I talked, in fact, I just, he's down in Tampa, Florida with the hurricane right now. And I called him yesterday. And he said they only got 50 mile an hour winds. And they were they were doing okay. Yeah. But I talked to him all the time. And then I talked to Hooper at least once a month. He lives up in Michigan. But the, well, uh, you, you were born Catholic, you went to Catholic schools, did you have chaplain over there in the yeah. Philippines and yeah. in Vietnam? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, when, you, when you're getting married, you have to go through the classes. Yeah. You know? Um, Three weeks or whatever. Whatever, whatever it was, and Nina was going through them, you know, usually go through together. Right. Well, we wanted to get married when I got home, and so we had to get that out of the way. So Nina went to him here alone, the full tilt of it. And then I went to the chaplain over there. You had a shorter version? Uh, yeah. We talked for a while. He says, you got brothers and sisters? Yep. They all married? Yep. They seem to get along? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, I said, I wrote her, we're, I'm done. It's a real long session. I'm, huh? I'm done, yeah. He was really kind of neat. Well, how did you get uh, notice that you were going to be coming back from Vietnam? Um, we, just because we, we, I had to go back to the Philippines. I mean, when we, when we, when we evacuated there, we flew into Quang Tri, and we back into Da Nang. And then back to Thompson Newton and got a plane to come back to the Philippines. Was that a commercial plane or an army plane? Our, it was a commercial yeah, plane. A commercial? Yeah. Uh, out of Thompson Newton. That was a big, big airport, huge. And then when we get back to the Philippines, um, not very long, they seized the Pueblo. Remember the yeah. spy ship, the spy ship that the North Koreans got? Mm -hmm. Well, South Korea's uh, communications weren't very good, so they sent us over there to re rewire Korea. And I went over there for three months, and then I went over for three more months later. So you went from the Philippines to Korea? Mm hmm And you were there three months? Uh -huh. Doing what? Uh, I was a tech controller, so... Uh, did you ever see the old the old phone jacks people with all the phones? Uh, like the old time operators used to have to do to connect you up. That's what we did. Uh, we we uh, we could we could we went over there and set up microwave. They didn't have any microwaves. That's that's mountain to mountain circuits and uh, uh, we we set up all new communications for Korea. Where were you in Korea? Osan, Osan Air Base. You were there three months? Uh-huh. Then what happened? 
Well, then I went back to the Philippines for a little while, and then they sent me back to Oshon. How long were you in the Philippines the second time? Maybe a month. What did you do there? Uh, they had a they had a Track 96 van out on the other side of the air base that we kept contract. We had another a, a separate line to uh, Vietnam to uh, NHA Natrang. NHA, NHA, I, we would call up all the time. And if, if they needed anything special, if the mob needed anything, they could get by any, all the other. <laughs> we had our own direct. So, so it, was a, it was a direct line. They didn't have to go through a lot of other communications. Yeah, yeah they didn't have to beg anybody to, <laughs> we need this and we need it now type thing. And, and you're on the receiving end of the phone call. Yep. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what authority did you have at that point? Oh, I didn't have any authority, but I got the message <clears throat> through. You know, we got it to the colonel, and the colonel handled it from there. If they needed, if whatever they needed, I mean, they they, they would call. It's like when we called for beer. It was, it was kind of an immediate answer. It was pretty neat. Did the, did the colonel ever question anything that uh, you relayed to him from? Never. From never. Him? Never. <clears throat> Never. I mean, it was a, it was, it wasn't like it was constant, but it, it was there. Mm -hmm. uh, we went out there with a, uh, there was two tech controllers, and uh, one one uh, uh, generator guy, that uh, all day long, all day, all night, we were there. So what, what were you? What was your regular day? Was that an eight-hour day or ten hours or twelve? Eight eight-hour days. We it was just like it, the Air Force was just like a job as far as I was concerned. When I was up in Desi, we worked, we worked shifts, eight, eight, we worked two swings, two days, two nights, eight hours a shift, and then you were off for 84 hours. I would come home then and work for my brother-in-law uh, in the construction business, and I was dating Nina at the time. And and uh, the Philippines, it was a eight hour day, pretty much. Yeah, but see, there wasn't a lot there to do in the Philippines. Yeah. We maintained the equipment. Um, they had they had guard duty, which was kind of a, a they kept they kept the Filipinos from coming in and and uh, stealing copper and things. But uh, you know, you didn't have weapons. You had to get a, a log book and a ship and a flashlight. But but uh, the, but that wasn't very often. But it was an eight-hour day. It was just a regular. So um, played played a lot of sports. Did you uh, have much day-to-day -day contact with the Filipinos? Sure, uh, all the time. So this is 20 years after World War II, and we saved their bacon. How did the uh, how did the Filipinos uh, they, they treat you? They liked us. They liked us a lot. I mean, we were we were in town. We we were never in any jeopardy downtown. Any time there was a jeopardy was when they were heading on elections, because of, and it was a little different than if they didn't like the if they really thought the guy was going to win, they just killed him. If they didn't want him. They would just get rid get rid of him, you know. Right. So when the elections were on, they told us not to go off base. Okay. But the Filipinos we had, of course, the ones that worked on base, were. Uh, they were very, they spoke good English, most of them. Um, uh, we spoke very little uh, t uh, Tagalog. We tried to, we tried to, to learn it, that it was, you know, we learned a little, a little bit here, a little bit there, but we had houseboys and, and uh, they kept our rooms clean and so how like old that. were these? How old were these houseboys? Fifty, sixty years old. How many? Fifty or sixty years old. Okay. Some of them. Some of them. There were no boys. They were all. And, okay. then, and then they would they would do your laundry. You would you would pay them extra for doing your laundry, and and we used to kid that all they do is take it home and beat it against a river rock. But it would come back clean anyway. Uh huh. And then you paid them. You paid them extra for that. Did you make any special friends uh, among the Filipinos at all? No, not really. Okay. No. Uh, how'd you get along with the the Vietnamese when you were over there? Didn't that much? Not much. Uh, not other much. than the cooks and the 
Okay. Yeah, none, nothing. Um, and in Korea, it was a little different. We we had we made we had more contact with them. They liked us. They liked the Americans more than I think the Filipinos did. But the Filipinos were fine. Mm -hmm. They didn't really have anything against us. Because so, you're, as you're right, we saved their bacon, and they and then we say we did the same thing in Korea. Korea, Korea, I think were, were more friendly. Um, did you? Did you travel around the countryside, uh, Korea at all? You know, I I never been out of Ohio until I went in the service, so I had no idea what the hell to do with it. Tra traveling around, I was I was a base guy. Um, so you didn't have a, have an opportunity to see uh, went, if there was any destruction remaining in Korea. From no, no, didn't do any of that, and it wasn't right. You know, it was it was more it was more. I was more concerned in Korea than I was in Vietnam because in Vietnam I knew there was action going on. In Korea, you didn't know if there was going to be action. You never knew what the hell they were going to do coming across the DMZ. How close were you to the DMZ in Korea? Pretty close, closer than I wanted to be. Uh, it wasn't that; it was just that the, you never knew what they were going to do for North, North Korea. And we still don't, do we? And we still don't, and and that's that's kind of a sad situation, but. You know, we, as long as we can keep them at bay, we're, we're, we're good. Is that the DD-214? Yeah, that's when I got out. Uh, what, um, what medals or badges uh, did did you get? As I told you, as I told you when I started, I did nothing special. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I was with the they they got the unit citation when I was at the the mobile first mob, and they uh, uh, I, I I didn't accrue anything that we did. I was just a gun. I was just a grunt, you know. That was all it was. I, I did my job, and I thought I did it well. And unfortunately, you didn't have any wounds. No, no. no. Come, anything come close? Any of the shelling come close? Yeah. To? Well, when I was in when Vietnam, it was really all close. It was really the the when we when we got there. We had a, we had our leave. There was two bunkers. One we one we left lived in, and one was the Air Force bunker. And we were in this other one, and we had our weapons and stuff in there. And they decided it would be best if I put our weapons over in the Air Force, over in that area. Well, then when we got hit, when they they decided we better have our weapons, so we took draw draw straws to see who goes and gets the weapons. And I, I, I got the short straw. Okay. So then I had to go from the one bunker to the other one, which is about 100 yards. And they shot at you. You know, you were moving around up there. And I, I went over and got our weapons and our ammunition and brought them back. And then we loaded up our clips. And because the sergeant had come into the bunker and said, uh, they're, they're coming in. Uh, you guys are going to maybe have to get out a wire. So well, there, there's these four Air, Air Force guys with their finger in their nose trying to figure out what the hell we're going to do with these weapons. I mean, we were trained on them, but... But you never shot at anybody. Man, didn't have to shoot at anybody. So what, what are they firing at you as you're running over to the other bunker to get to the what, weapons? Them AK-47s and stuff. Well, yeah, it was rifle fire. Any mortars coming in? Mortars on came in all the time. Yeah, they were constant. Uh, uh, on your trip over to the other uh, bunker, yeah, uh, they were, they were, yeah, they, they, if there was movement, they, they, they unloaded, you know, and they were shooting rockets. They had this 120 millimeter rockets, and they would fire them. What was this at nighttime? Daytime. Daytime. Yeah, we didn't. We were. Well, uh, we, well, how did you get uh, over 100 yards between bunkers without getting I just, hit? I just kept going. I just kept going. I just, it was, I just, I just, I knew I had to do it and I went and did it. 
it wasn't anything spectacular. It was just, you know, and it, it wasn't like it was close to the wire where we were. But I went over, they shot at us, at, and maybe they were just bad shots. I have no idea, but I didn't, didn't nothing happened to me. Well, thank God you made it. Yeah. So, I had, uh, only, you, only had to pick up four rifles and, you know. Ammunition and get back. Four, yeah. So, uh, let's take you over to the Korea the second time. Did you do the same thing the second time as you did the first time? Exactly. Almost exactly. I had some pictures. I don't know if I, I have some pictures. Um, we, we, we were in Quonset huts over there and it was cold. It, it, the second time I went, it was colder than hell. It was really cold. And when we went, we didn't have any clothes to wear. We didn't have any. Didn't have any winter clothes? No. We, we had uh, our jacket, pea coats, you know, where they, not a pea coat. We had our jackets that they weren't lined or anything. And you could tell the, the, the Filipino guys, because we all had short sleeves on and long, long underwear and short sleeves coming out. And then, and then later on, they got us some clothes to wear. Well, how long did it take them to get you some decent clothes? Yeah, a couple, about a month, I bet. How long were you over there a second time? Three months. Another three months stint? Yeah. Where'd you go from Korea after your three months? Back to the Philippines. How and long then, were you in the Philippines that second time? Well, until I got out. And, and I don't exactly know how long that was. How, how did you get uh, notified that you were coming home? Well, they do, uh, they, they do the... Uh, it's like an, an exit interview. Uh, they wanted me to re-enlist. They promised me the world. So what, what kind of world did they promise you? Well, they, they, uh, they used to have what they called a variable re-enlistment bonus, a VRB. And they promised me if I'd sign up, they'd give me four times my yearly salary. And I told them I wanted to come home. And I was done. You were anxious to come home and get married. Yep, I was, yeah. So, uh, how did you get home? Plane, flew. boat, flew. Oh, always flying. I, you know that. I, people said, "Why did you join the Air Force?" I said, "Because I didn't want to walk anywhere." <laughs> <laughs> we flew everywhere. So, did you fly home, commercial or military? Uh, military to to uh, San Francisco, Travis Air Base, and then uh, um, and then commercial home. When when I was when I was in the Philippines, I, I, you know, you're there 18 months. I was I was stationed in Dayton for all that time, and and none of the time at my school or any of that, I never took any leave. And so when I got over to the Philippines, I had a bunch of leave accrued, and and they they got me in there, and they said, you know, if uh, the most you can sell back when you leave is two months of leave, and you have more than that. Uh, so you're gonna have to take leave. And I said, well, then I wanna go home. And they said, well, no, you can't go home. You're, a, you're an overseas base. I said, if you're making me take my leave, I wanna go home. So I got permission to come home, to fly home. I tried to get on a military standby out of the Philippines, but the Filipinos joined the Navy, the United States Navy, and they, they filled those planes up going in and out, back and forth on their bases, and I couldn't get a flight out. I had a hell of a time. So I went around to all the little, all the little squadrons on the base, and I'd talk, and I'd find out if they had any planes going to the States. And I found one, I found one plane that was going to go back to Texas on a, uh, they had to work on it, they had to do something to it. I think it was just a bunch of officers wanted to go home. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I, I had to go to a, uh, uh, I can't remember the name, but, but I, I, had to, I had to be able to work on the plane so I, I went to a little class uh, and, and uh, I got certified. And uh, <laughs> they, uh, so then I flew 
from the Philippine Islands to another island, to Guam. But when they then, but see when they flew it was C one thirty, then there was they hit too many hours, then we'd stop, and they 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 would go to the officers barracks, and I would stay in the airport and I would try to get another plane to catch. Uh -huh. So I'm living in the air in the airport. You then just, then yeah. the next day the next day they came back to get on their C one thirty, and I would jump on that with them, and we go to the next island. So you're always going standby. <laughs> I was all standby. Get into the Philippines, or get into uh, Guam, get into Hawaii. And I'd spent some days doing this already, you know. And she's waiting for me. Get to Hawaii, get on a, a commercial plane, and you're like, you know, we got to get this for her. Some Navy guy gets on the plane and says, this is a Navy plane. If you're not Navy, get off. So they made us get off the damn plane. Oh, really? They put a Navy on there. And I had 50 bucks in my pocket if I had a dime. And uh, I just, I went over to American Airlines, I think it was. I don't remember. And I said to the girl, I gotta fly standby. How far will 50 bucks get me to the States? And she says, about mm, 40 miles offshore. <laughs> 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 so, so, you know, I, I gave her my best droopy eyed look. I'm trying to go home, see my girl. And so they write me a ticket to get me into San Francisco. And then I had Nina. I called her in the middle of the night. Well, she had money of mine. I said, send me a ticket from the Chicago to home. So I flew standby, and we finally finally got home. Oh, jeez. But going back was just as bad. It was just as bad. It was hard getting flights to go back. And they warned me, 30 days. You'll be back in 30 days, or we're going to put you in a brig. I thought, God. It took you 30 days just to go through the red tape. Yeah, it was unbelievable, you know. So did you get married when you came back? No, we wanted to. We, we were talking about it, but we didn't. Um, no, we didn't. So she actually you, wanted to come over there, and it wasn't really a place to do that. So when, after you'd been home, where did you, you went from Cincinnati to where to go back to the Philippines? Well, you know, same, it was just same, same route. Same route. You know, San Francisco, Hawaii, oh, yeah, Guam, yeah, and Guam. Yep, yeah. So, did you get to spend any time uh, uh, looking around Hawaii? No. Well, no. You had no money. You, you know, you don't have any money. And and I was in the airport trying to get the hell out of there because I had to get back. <laughs> so we went to we went to Hawaii years later. Her father gave us a trip uh, up for us and the whole family to go over there. <laughs> I saw Hawaii then. That was grow gorgeous, but um, and no, no, there, there was that. No, there was never an excess of money. Well, how long did it take you to get back to base? Did you make it within your thirty days? Yeah, oh yeah, I made it just, just, just barely made it, just barely made it. Yeah, I you, begged. I was, I was in. I, I don't know if I was Guam or Hawaii. I begged. I begged to get. I said, I'll fly. I'll, I'll, I'll sit anywhere. I, I got to get back. I'm gonna get in jam. So then I got back. I talked a lot. I learned. I know how to talk. Uh huh. So I talked a lot. You know how to talk and beg, huh? Uh, that beg. I had a beg. But we, we, uh, yeah. It was, it was nice to come home. It was nice to see her. Um, so when you got back to the Philippines, uh, how long were you there before you came back home for good? <clears throat> You know, I'm, I'm going to say maybe six months, but I'm not positive. That was a while. You, anything special you did over there? Not a thing. We just were, you know, what we did, we maintained our equipment there so it was in ready if they had to send it out. Uh -huh. But really, we had no circuits there. We accepted at, at, at Track 96 on the other side of the base. We didn't have any anything really to do. 
a lot of tennis, a lot of things, you know, uh -huh. to keep yourself in, in shape. And uh, the, the, that was pretty much it. It was just, a, it was just like a job, uh -huh. just like having a job. Um, and just having a different employer, that's all. So, so uh, when they debriefed you, did they do that here in the States or did they do that in the Philippines? They did it in the Philippines. Um, yeah. So was there much to that other than uh, trying to get you to re-enlist? Yeah, no, not really. No. So how'd you get home that time? Another commercial flight? Yeah, yeah they, that was the easy part because then you had to reschedule. You get on a plane with all the Filipino sailors and you had your spot, you know, and at that time, you know, they said, don't, don't get on a plane, don't say hijack, don't, don't, don't be a wise ass, just get on the plane, shut your mouth and go. Because uh -huh. back then they were having the hijack planes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then the other, the other kind of the funny part, when I was going out the first time to the Philippines, uh, there was a guy named Richard Speck in Chicago that killed all those nurses. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. My name is Speck. I'm flying through Chicago. <laughs> I took my name tag off. Oh, did you? Hell yeah. I didn't want anybody blaming me. <laughs> Put it back on later. But uh, I thought that's all I got to do is get caught with that. Yeah. 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 So uh, how'd you get from... Uh, California to Cincinnati when you came home finally. Just uh, commercial, commercial. They actually got, got you all the way home, For, to where you enlisted. They they send you back. So I was sad. Did Nina know you were when you were due back? Yeah. Um, How about your folks? Did they know? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Who met well, you at the airport? We were. My Nina did. I had changed. I was so crummy from flying. Well, Nina, was that when I changed into civilian clothes? When I changed into civilian clothes, yeah, you she she was looking for somebody in uniform, and I was in civilian clothes. <laughs> she didn't walk by her. She didn't recognize me. She, <laughs> she, she said I got I had jeans on and a shirt. She, she didn't like. I thought, damn, <laughs> it's been too long. I, huh? I haven't changed that much. <laughs> so uh, when you got back home. Uh, what did you do? How long did it take you to get a job? I had a job. Um, I worked for that little Coles packing company. Uh -huh. They took you back? They took me back, and it didn't last long. Uh, they really, it's a small company, and they really didn't need me. Um, they made me a, a swapper, you know, where you run different routes, doing different things. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, hadn't been a, I hadn't been home for two years. So as far as... Um, I didn't know the routes, and I'd get lost, and mm -hmm. you know they sent me to Lebanon and stuff like that, and I would, I just didn't really know my way. All right. And so I, 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 I left there, and 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 got a job uh, working inside downtown for a. Uh, uh, employment agency for about three days. For three I, days. Yeah, I hated it. It was it was uh, it was all sitting on the in the desk, on the phone, uh, calling, and I didn't it, it wasn't for me. So that I I wound up cutting a job cutting cutting meat out in Cherry Grove. For a guy named Ron Fallsgrave, and uh, cut meat for him for quite a while. I, I learned that when I was in high school. Yeah. And then, and then uh, I worked there and then worked for a company called Low Ray Packing Company, which was a company down in Cincinnati. Drove a truck and on the days off, her dad had a small construction company for over in the western side of town little bulldozers and he used to build houses. It was all, all uh, residential and no commercial? Yeah. And uh, uh, I would work for him on the day, my day off. I would get two days off from the meat, meat from cutting meat. And I would, uh, he and he would, 
I would work for him on those days. And then he offered me a job. And I took it. And I worked there for 47 years. What did you do starting out with him, and what did you do ending up with him? Were you a carpenter or well, a heavy I, equipment I, operator? Actually, I could do it all. I did everything. I built homes, and I ran equipment, and I became a master plumber. Uh, I, got the, I got a license, a commercial license to, to do plumbing in Ohio. Um, I did just about anything he asked, and I did it. So we built homes. We built nice homes. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, we ran, we had started out with a couple of pieces of equipment. And if you rode past over there on North Bend Road, you see all that equipment sitting over there. And that's the company now. It's Her brothers are all running it, or in there now. And what I, was the name of the company when you joined? Uh, <laughs> it was the V and G D J and J Rack Company. And the people would say, well, where's your initial? And I'd say, see the dot behind CO? That's spec. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where I'm at. But uh, 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 her, brothers are, her brothers were on our wedding. They were, they were the altar boys, uh -huh. two, two of the brothers. And two of them were actually in the wedding. And... Uh, how many brothers and sisters did she have? She was the oldest of seven. And uh, there, there's her one brother's past. The oldest brother's past. And all her brothers are still working the business. Oh, good. good. And she has a sister, Mary. Well, we talked about uh, you and Dinah getting married June 21 of 69. How many children did you guys have? We had three. Uh, tell me their names and their ages. We had Cynthia, who married a guy named Jeff Larkin. We have my son, John. Well, how old is Cynthia? She's 50, is he 52, Naya? She got 52 on the sheet here. I think she's 52. My son, John, here, he's uh, 50. He's with us today, and he was holding up the map. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, I have a daughter, Christine, who married Eric Fricky. And uh, she's she, she's th three years younger than you, John? Two. Two years? She, she's 48. And her, her last name is spelled F-R-I-C-K-E? Yeah. Now, does Cynthia have children? Cynthia had three children. Um, Jeffrey, Allison, and uh, Jeffrey, Jen Jessica, and Allison. She has she had three children. Three children. Yep. And John. How John's many? got five. And his is uh, Russell, and Sean, and Sarah, and twin girls, Rachel and Dorothy. Okay. And how about uh, Christine? Christine's got three girls. Her oldest is at West Virginia University as we speak. Uh, that's Marissa. When Jocelyn, who's graduating from Macaulay High School this year, and and uh, Ada, who's at St. James now, seventh grade. So what's what's John do? What's his job? I don't know. I don't think he works. Weren't you laid off or something? I'm not working. Right <laughs> In between jobs? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How about well, Cynthia? I, I never get the I, I never get the name of your company right. So I. Veracast. It's, it's out of California, isn't it? San Antonio. San Antonio. So does Cynthia work outside the home? Yes. What she do? She works for Kemba, a Kemba uh, credit union. And uh, Christine, she work outside the she, home? She works for Amazon. She's an HR in, at Amazon. They all work hard, man. They all work hard. I'm proud of them. So when did you when did you retire from the construction? No, I mean, 71, <coughs> 70, 71, 72. What? No, no. that's not true. No, I was 71. I, I, it's about six or seven years ago. Okay. So what have you done in retirement? Nothing. Well, you have to do something. <laughs> oh, you know, I enjoy the grandkids. 
Done any traveling? No. Not, no, we just do. We take a yearly vacation. We go to Florida, take the whole family. Everybody goes. What part of Florida? Uh, we go to, to uh, Destin. That's on the northwest on part? Panhandle, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's very nice down there. We've been doing that for years. Uh, by the way, my oldest grandson, my do the oldest daughter, her, her son has two, two, I have two great grandsons. Okay. And they're, they're around, they're just six and 10, but I, I want to mention them anyway. Well, good. So we've got a great family, great family. Tom, can you think of anything you might want to ask him? John, is there anything? Uh, like I said, it wasn't. And it, it, nothing, there was nothing remarkable about, about what we, what I did. I just did what they told me to. Well, thank you for your service. I appreciate it. John, do you have anything you want to ask him or bring out? I would just add that we're, we're very proud of him, and and I'd like to thank you both for for doing thorough interviews. Well, thank you. Is there anything I haven't asked you about that you want to talk about? Any, any kind of mischief you got into as a kid? Or? No, no. <laughs> yeah. A lot of that. Any yeah. mischief in the, in the service that you... Uh, no, you know, uh, that's one thing they didn't put up with. They really didn't... Uh, they, didn't they didn't smile about any of that. They, 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 it was pretty straight. But, and then I liked that. that was Were you happy with the Air Force? Yes. Yeah, I'd... I'd I, I, in fact, my granddaughter's boyfriend, Jocelyn, she's the senior. Her boyfriend just went in and she got to talk to him for two minutes. <laughs> He's in basic. Uh -huh. And she said, how do you like it? He said, I wish I never got on the plane. <laughs> but he's in the worst part of it. Yeah, you know, yeah. In the, in the, uh, and it, it's, you just got to go through it. It's nothing. It's nothing. They can't eat you. Do you uh, get together with any of your uh, compatriots? I, I, I'm, I belong to the VFW. I, inter I introduced my son to the VFW down in Ironton, Ohio. We went down there for a little three weeks, three weeks ago. No, you, you didn't pronounce that right. It's Arnton. 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 Well, That's the way the locals pronounce it. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, well, we went there and uh, we had a great time. Uh, well, they, they welcomed us and they, Good. you know, they buy you a drink. Good. So, John, this is a funny story, I think. So I told the, bar, the barmaid, I said, just give everybody in the bar a drink. And he said, God, Dad, that's going to cost you a fortune. That's that's going to cost you a lot of money. And the girl comes back. I said, what is it? She said, $25. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> it's all cheap. You know, it's all cheap place to drink. And they give you a shot of drink, a shot of booze like that. <laughs> he said, Dad, it's going to cost you a lot of money. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> so that's, that's, but that's, that was the VFW hall. Yeah, we didn't buy another one of the rest Yeah, of them. and then they wouldn't let you buy anything yeah. else. Yeah. 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 We had to stop them. That's enough. That's, we, we had to get, we had to drive back to Ashland. Uh huh. But, uh, that was, that was fun. Well, it's nice talking with you. Thanks, Pat. Thank I you appreciate for your it. interview. Thank you. And thank you for your service. I appreciate it. It was very important that you were there. Well, uh, I'm glad you didn't get hurt. I don't know about that yet. I don't know about that, but it was uh, an experience. Good. That's that's that was the thing, and uh, that's why I try to tell you that I, there's nothing remarkable there. There's there's other guys. There's a guy named Bob Abrams that I know. That he was in Vietnam for a long time, and he's got the bronze medal, and he's a hell of a hell of a guy. You, and you see him often? He's in the VFW with me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, might uh, ask him if he's ever been interviewed. I'll come down and uh, interview him. Uh, that would be a good thing. Yeah. He'd be a good guy. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it, guys.